Okay, so uh, today is the uh, is September seventeenth, Saturday, and uh, this morning I would like to uh, do a reading. I, I think I've mentioned I'd like to read a bunch uh, or a series uh, from Aiken Roshi, one of my main teachers. Kaplan Roshi uh, was the main teacher, the root teacher, you might say, and Aiken Roshi was a very, very important teacher. Uh, and Danin Roshi was the, the kind of connector between the two, being both a Kaplo lineage uh, sanctioned teacher and also a, a, Dharman, a Diamond Sangha through Aitken Roshi, Dharma Master. Um, so I'd like to read from uh, and comment on Original Dwelling Place uh, Zen Buddhist Essays by Aitken Roshi. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the reason I'm choosing that for today is because it's so fundamental. It, it really goes right to the uh, core of uh, Zen practice. Uh, and it's looking at the way of Dogen Zenji, uh, which is always uh, heartening and, and uh, quite wonderful. Uh, let me see if I can see everybody here. I know it's a little hard to pin and still see. Uh, can't. It gets wacky. Okay. All right. We'll try our best. Um, and just a few words on, on listening or participating in Teisho. <clears throat> Teisho is seen as another form of Zen practice. So we don't listen to Teisho as to a lecture. And we should think of it being uh, directed to us alone, as if there was no audience whatsoever except ourselves. And we continue with our practice. In other words, we practice Teisho. So if you're experiencing the breath or working on a koan, you will continue experiencing the breath or working on a koan. Counting breath can get a little complex. Uh, and so if you can't do uh, both, that is attend to the practice, and attend to the Teisho, then listening, allowing the words in without mulling over them takes precedence. It'd be like listening to the wind in the trees. If you start mulling over something that's been said in the Teisho, the Teisho has already moved on uh, and you're left with your thinking. So the thing is to just breathe right into the Teisho and be present with it and allow the Teisho in, allow the words in, like the wind in the trees, without turning it into an intellectual fodder, but let it experience you. Uh, Teisho literally means presenting the shout. In other words, Zen teachers do not lecture about the Dharma, they present the Dharma through their words and uh, uh, the way they uh, uh, enunciate and so on, the way the lines that they might speak or comment. So this is a challenge for all of us, for the teacher, as well as for uh, the students. We're all in this together. So the way of Dogen Zenji was actually, uh, this essay, actually uh, the introduction to an excellent book on Dogen, uh, He Jin Kim's Dogen Keegan, Mystical Realist. If you don't know it and are interested in uh, Dogen, he and Hakuin are probably the two greatest uh, Japanese teachers of our line, combined line. Uh, uh, Dogen is in the 1200s, uh, Hakuin is in the 1700s. Very different personalities, both of tremendously deep creativity and uh, insight and practice. So um, this was an introduction to the revised edition of uh, uh, Dogen Keegan, uh, Mystical Realist, which came out in 1987, um, or at least that's when, yeah, that's when the uh, revised edition appeared. And this is Aiken Roshi's uh, forward to it, which I'll comment on. So He Jin Kim's Dogen Keegan, Mystical Realist, was the first comprehensive study in English of Dogen Zenji's writings. And for the past 12 years at that time, it served as the principal English language reference for those Dogen scholars who work from his 13th century Japanese and for Western Zen students reading translations of his writings. This new edition appears in a scholarly setting that now includes many new translations and studies of Dogen, and thus it is most welcome. Dogen wrote at the outermost edge of human communication, touching with every sentence such mysteries as self and other, self and no self, 
meditation and realization, the temporal and the timeless, forms and the void. He moved freely from the acceptance of a particular mode as complete in itself to an acknowledgement of its complementarity with others to a presentation of its unity with all things and back again. He wrote of the attitude necessary for understanding of the practice required of the various insights that emerge and of the many pitfalls. He did not generally write for beginners. Most of his points require very careful study, and a few of them elude almost everybody. These challenges are compounded by his creative use of the Japanese language of his time. It has been said that he wrote in Dogenese, where he made verbs of nouns, nouns of verbs, created new metaphors, and manipulated old sayings to present his particular understanding. For example, uh, there's a great, uh, very famous uh, phrase in Zen, uh, painted cakes do not satisfy hunger. Well, Dogen's commentary on it, in other words, looking at a, uh, a picture of food, uh, isn't going to satisfy your hunger. That is, thinking about realization is not going to be the same as actual realization. Uh, and that's seen as a distinction very central to Zen. Well, what does Dogen do with it? He turns it around and he said, only painted cakes can satisfy hunger. So uh, he's quite profound and quite creative and, and he takes our mind into places uh, you would not think. Uh, and from there steps into realization. Uh, he doesn't, he's never, even though he's quite the intellectual, he's never content with allowing anyone uh, to remain in a merely intellectual understanding. And so his creative use of language leads to doorways into realization. Um, thus, the writings of Dogen are an immense challenge to anyone seeking to explicate them in English, but Kim does a masterful job. I do not presume to explicate Kim's words, but to offer a personal perspective of Dogen in hopes that it might serve as access to Kim's incisive scholarship. I choose as my theme a key passage in the Genjo Koan, uh, which is from uh, the Shobo Genzo, the Eye of the True Dharma, uh, uh, Dogen's masterwork, uh, the essay that Dogen placed at the head of his great collection of talks and essays. Uh, and he uses, Aiken says, I use Kim's translation here. And here it is. This is the essence of Dogen Zen. To study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things of the universe. To be enlightened by all things of the universe is to cast off the body and mind of the self as well as those of others. Even the traces of enlightenment are wiped out and life with traceless en enlightenment is continued forever and ever. Let me reread that. To study the way is to study the self. This is the key. This is the core of it. People think you're adding somehow in Buddhist practice, you're going to get wisdom and you're going to get compassion. The Zen view is... Um, uh, these things, uh, as the Buddha said in his great enlightenment uh, 2,500 years ago, wonder of wonders, all beings are intrinsically Buddhas, fully endowed with wisdom and virtue. Only their self-centered, delusive thinking prevents them from realizing this. So the essence of the whole deal is what is this very self that's practicing? What's this very self that wants wisdom, that wants compassion? What is this very self that hears these words right now? What is this self? If we truly see into this, we may find that what we've been looking for has been here from the start. But so often we are so caught up in thoughts of ourselves, as the Buddha said 2,500 years ago, that we fail, fail to see what's always been here. In our great vows for all, we vow at the last of the four vows, Buddha's, Buddha's way is unattainable. I vow to embody it fully, or I vow to embody it all. 
it's unattainable because you can't get what you already have. You can't enter a room you've never left. But it takes a lifetime of practice to realize what this really means, that they're not just pleasing words. What is this very self right now that sits here thinking, hearing, seeing colors with the eyes, feeling with the body? So to study the self is to forget the self, not because we push the self away. That's very immature practice to think you can repress or suppress or push yourself past the self. Uh, in some ways, that's known as spiritual bypassing. You just put yourself in a little box and you go around having wonderful spiritual experiences. But you've never worked on yourself. You've never really understood the self. You've never seen how empty, vast and empty it truly is. Instead, we identify with the, thought, the thoughts that arise in our mind over and over. and We can't forget ourselves. We're always thinking of the next thing I must do. And the next anxiety I must deal with. Um, we live our lives in this box of me, myself, and I, Dogen says, to study the self, that is to see it arise with each breath and to see it fall away, is to, in time, forget the self. We no longer get so caught up in it. Eventually, we forget it so well that it falls away completely. That is all concepts of myself. It doesn't mean I fall down or my body drops to the ground. It means all concepts about myself fall away and I can be myself, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, feeling, thinking. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things of the universe, Dogen says elsewhere. To push the self forward to become one with things is called delusion. For the 10,000 things, it is all things, pencils, uh, cars, uh, crows, uh, pebbles, rivers, mountains, other people, all of it. Um, uh, to forget the self is to allow everything in and everything, the 10,000 things, realize themselves through and as the self. That's the essence of it. Uh, and that's only, of course, the beginning of it. We catch a glimpse of it. That's called Kensho. Uh, just a little glimpse, and then we can begin really working uh, to mature as human beings. So to forget the self is to be enlightened by all things of the universe. To be enlightened by all things of the universe, that is the 10,000 things step in an army. I don't have to look for a self. Uh, there's no place it isn't. Uh, to be enlightened by all things of the universe is to cast off the body and mind of the self that is concepts about our myself, as well as those of other self and other primary, primary uh, dualism of the mind. Me and here and everyone and everything else out there, distant. Uh, what if that all falls away? It's a thought. What then? Ordinary life is something quite mysterious, just as it is. We don't have to make it mysterious. Uh, even the traces of enlightenment, traces of enlightenment are, are wiped out. Why? Because who is there to be enlightened? Uh, to cling to ideas or thoughts of enlightened. I'm enlightened is the great sickness of Zen. People have had genuine realization and they get stuck for how long? I've got it, I understand. Uh, just another sickness of the mind uh, to work through, let go of. Uh, so, And life with traceless enlightenment is continued forever and ever. Endless path is the name of our zendo uh, because simply practice continues endlessly. Only it's no longer a burden, no longer a forced effort. Selfless practice, relatively selfless practice, continues endlessly. And it's an endless life, uh, it's a lifetime work. It's not like, oh, you get this and now you're, you're oh, good, you're enlightened. No. Another word for enlightenment is intimacy. One 
doesn't get intimacy, one becomes intimate with all things. The barriers of me and here and you out there become much finer, uh, less destructive. Of course, when they're firmly in place, we create a very hellish environment as we're doing on this earth right now. So this is not just uh, philosophy, it has tremendous practical implications for how we treat one another, how we treat this living earth, how we treat other species. Uh, Dogen really goes to the heart of it. So to continue, uh, Aiken Roshi, to study the way is to study the self. Asian languages offer the same options as English for the meaning of the word or verb study. To paraphrase dictionary definitions, it is to examine with the intention of learning. Thus, I would interpret Dogen's words as to come to understand the way is to come to understand the self. Indeed, what could be more intimate than my own self? To me, what is this self? You walk around in a daze, we have no idea who or what we are. And we take that as normal. Think about how abnormal that is. We talk about myself all the time, but we have no idea really. What is this self? Dogen says rock. The term way is a translation of do or do in Japanese, dao in Chinese. It is the ideograph used to identify the central doctrine of Taoism and its basic text, the Tao Te Ching. Kumara Jiva, Jiva and his colleagues in the early 5th century selected Tao as a translation of Dharma, a key Sanskrit Buddhist term meaning law, or the way of the universe and its phenomena, or simply phenomena. In Dogen's view, all phenomena are the Buddha Dharma. The way of the universe is understood through Buddhist practice. Indeed, for Dogen to study and understand the Buddha way is to practice the Buddha way. To really to study and understand means to practice, not to sit there and cogitate on it, but to practice it. And to practice the Buddha way is to have the self practice, not to sit back and be thinking so much about it, which is at times totally appropriate. Thought is a terrific tool, but to practice it using the self to practice. We put ourselves in the zendo, we cross our legs, we experience or count the breath, we work on a koan, we sit beyond thinking in shikantaza. This is to practice the way. It is important to understand that practice is both action and attainment. Modes of practice are zen, realization, and the careful work beyond realization, which is where subsequent uh, or introductory koans begin. Uh, we can say subsequent koans to the first, which is generally the sound of a uh, mu, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? Zhao Chu answered mu, or the sound of a single hand. Uh, these are usually our introductory, or first, let's say, not introductory, but um, really the major uh, introduction to koan practice begins with either of these two really uh, essential koans, and then with some glimmer, some glimmer of understanding, we can begin work beyond an initial, uh, our slight realization, and continue to deepen and broaden that through ongoing koan practice. All these are complete in themselves, and they are also means for further completion. They are acts of particular moments, and they're also stages in the course of time. As to the self, it has no abiding nature, and in Blake words, Blake's words, uh, Blake, of course, William Blake, our great sage of the uh, West in uh, 17th and 18th century England, uh, and in Blake's words, kisses the joy as it flies. It is the Buddha coming forth now as a woman, now as a youth, now as a child, now as an old man, now as an animal, a plant, or a cloud. However, animals and plants and clouds cannot study in Dogen's sense. So in this context, Dogen refers to the human being that can focus the self and make personal the vast and fathomless void, the infinitely varied beings and their marvelous harmony. Uh, this is what the human being, each of us, can do. Now, um, we might say that the practice, koan practice is a uh, 
uh, Zen monks are known as unsui. It's a word that means clouds and water. Uh, clouds have no fixed form. Atmospheric conditions change the shape of a cloud. Water has no fixed shape. Pour it into a round container, it's round. Pour it into a square container, it's square, and so on. So unsui means the self is not fixed when you're truly practicing, but uh, accords and accommodates the causes and conditions, the unfolding of cause and effect. Uh, and so uh, in this, uh, we're, we find our freedom by pouring ourselves into each of the subsequent koans and taking the shape of that koan and realize the foundation of the self in each koan circumstance. This is buying our freedom, you might say, breath by breath, learning to uh, not be fixed, not be stuck uh, in a habitual loop of who we assume ourselves to be but creatively finding ways to express our understanding as this very self. Um, it sounds very philosophical. It's not. It's a lot more fun, actually, uh, and quite freeing, uh, removing our stickiness over time. It takes time. It's an ongoing practice. So uh, to continue, to study the self is to forget the self. Here Dogen sets forth the nature of practice. My teacher, Yamada Koan Roshi, has said, Zen practice is a matter of forgetting the self in the act of uniting with something. Uh, that is to unite with this breath, uh, this count, uh, this question, who am I? Who hears? What is Mu? Uh, this Ka! Uh, we do not become enlightened so much as we enter into the practice and realize intimacy with just this breath, just this call, just this uh, sense of the pain in my knee, uh, just this taste of tea when I drink, become really present without habitual screens of self-centeredness. We do this again and again. It's an ongoing practice. To unite with something is to find it altogether vivid like the thrush, say, singing in the guava grove. Remember, Aiken Roshi lived in Hawaii, so his examples tend to be somewhat tropical. Uh, there is just that song, a point of no dimension, of cosmic dimension. The soul self is forgotten. This is something like the athlete who's completely involved in catching the ball, freed of self-doubt and thoughts of attainment, at the same time aware of the other players and their positions. Using this same human ability on one's meditation cushions is the great way of realization. It must be distinguished from thinking about something. When you are occupied in thinking, you are shrouded by your thoughts and the universe is shut out. That is, it's distant. It's not intimate. It's not vivid. Zen practice enables us to live in this present moment, intimately, with whatever is actually here, and vividly seeing uh, the color of the grass, seeing the movement of the clouds, feeling the touch of cold water on our hands when we turn the tap, vividly, personally, intimately, not in our heads. But that frees us to use our heads to think vividly, and not be stuck in habitual loops of thought. That's the essence of it. Again, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, there are other analogies for gathering oneself in a single act of religious practice, freeing oneself of doubt and attainment. Simon, uh, Simone Weil sets forth the academic analogy, contemplating an object fixedly with the mind, asking myself, what is it? without thinking of any other object relating to it or anything else were hours on end. That was her practice in France uh, during the Second World War. Uh, a very interesting thinker, Simone Weil. Dogen often uses the phrase mustering the body and mind to understand oneself and the world. Using Kim's translation of a later passage in Genjo Koan, this is the quote, <coughs> excuse me, Mustering our bodies and minds, we see things, and mustering our bodies and minds, we hear sounds. Thereby we understand them intimately. However, it is not like a reflection dwelling in the mirror, 
nor is it like the moon and the water. As one side is illumined, the other is darkened. Uh, let's see what that means. This mustering is Zazen, and also the activity of the Zen student who is grounded in Zazen. Kim quotes Dogen writing elsewhere in Shobogenzo, the eye of the treasury of the true Dharma. Uh, and this is from the Bendoa, uh, which is really uh, the opening of the Shobogenzo. Uh, he didn't fit it. Uh, it came from his very early time when he just returned to Japan from China. Uh, the Buddhas and Tathagatas have an ancient way, unequaled and natural, to transmit the wondrous Dharma through personal encounter we might say uh, doksang, through personal encounter, and to realize supreme enlightenment. As it is imparted impeccably from Buddha to Buddha, and who is not Buddha, except we don't know it, we don't realize it intimately. <clears throat> As it is imparted impeccably from Buddha to Buddha, its criterion is a samadhi. Samadhi is falling away of the self, complete sense of, for lack of a better word, oneness. But of course, oneness doesn't mean everything is one. It means that everything is fully distinct. Each thing completely itself, unique, vivid, whole. Uh, that oneness uh, is what makes vivid difference possible. Uh, so it's not a numerical one. For playing joyfully in such a samadhi, the upright sitting in meditation is the right gate. Uh, so Eiken Roshi goes on. With the practice of Zazen, mustering body and mind, we understand a thing intimately by seeing or hearing, and the self is forgotten. When you think of the best moments in your life, uh, the self was forgotten. People get so scared thinking, the self will be forgotten. Oh my gosh, will I be like a zombie? But think, when you saw a beautiful sunset, let's say, and the colors just moved you. Well, you sat by a waterfall uh, and just were so moved by that water. Or, or you saw a child uh, and just reached out. Or, or a dog came, uh, you loved came running to. In other words, you, or you listened to music that you loved. The best moments in our life is, have always been when the self is forgotten. Zen is teaching us how to live this way with the self forgotten. And everything steps in like those as in those most wonderful moments. This can include moments that we typically would think of as not so wonderful. Uh, and yet everything is whole and complete and steps in. With the self forgotten, uh, even standing on line uh, uh, at the airport uh, can be interesting. Uh, even uh, getting your sigmoidoscopy as I did yesterday uh, interesting. Uh, weird, but interesting. Uh, all, all these opportunities of forgetting the self by becoming one with what's going on. Uh, Zen is teaching us how to live these moments as our whole ordinary life, brushing our teeth, getting up, saying good morning, saying good night, turning on the light, turning off the light. What a wonderful life. <clears throat> Uh, this kind of understanding uh, is not by simile, it is not a representation like the moon reflected in the water, but it is a brilliant presentation of the thing itself and is a complete personal acceptance. One side is illumined, there is only that thrush. Uh, here we don't hear thrushes so much, we might hear caw, caw, uh, just that crow. At the same time, the universe is present in the shadow. The other players are still there. Then he goes on. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things of the universe. The term enlightened is sho, as again is Aiken Roshi. Uh, the same sho found in Inka Shome, the document given to a senior student by a master, confirming him or her as a teacher. <clears throat> That's what I received from Danian Roshi when he transmitted the Dharma to me, making me an independent teacher. That's the uh, Inca certificate. The thrush confirms you, enlightens you, but be careful not to give enlightenment anything more than provisional status. It is likely to be just a peep into the nature of things. 
Uh, we've mentioned this before. Uh, the word satori really means a complete a kind of majestic experience where really uh, the self has completely fallen away uh, and you're really there uh, and uh, it transforms you right then and there. However, um, that's very rare. Uh, Kensho uh, simply means a, a glimpse of self-nature, seeing self-nature. That is more common uh, through koan practice. We glimpse self-nature. We don't become all wise. We don't become all compassionate, all like that. But through continued work on koans over years and years, that initial glimpse deepens, becomes more intimate, becomes the very bones we walk on. And this over time is not so much the word transformative is loaded. It's as if I become transformed. No, it's more that I fade away. I become much more present without that screen of me, myself, and I. Uh, and this uh, able ability to live from this becomes more ordinary experience. So the initial uh, Kensho, let's say, is just a peep. Uh, nonetheless, uh, to go on to Ikan Roshi, one impulse from a vernal wood or the morning star, which is what the Buddha saw, shining over the Bodhi tree is a deep communication. The communication works the other way from the self to the object, but the result is different, as Dogen makes clear earlier in the Genjo Koan, and that is that the self advances and confirms the myriad things is called delusion. In other words, go, I'm becoming one with this, is already a kind of delusion, a high class delusion, that the myriad things advance and confirm the self is enlightenment or intimacy. In other words, my sense of me in here and you out there kind of falls away and we realize uh, the tree, the, the star, the river, the other person is myself, not conceptually, not a conceptual realization of it. It steps in and is me. This is what intimacy or enlightenment means. <clears throat> the way of research and analysis is called delusion. Don't condemn it, Dogen is saying. By advancing and confirming and throwing light on all things of the universe, you reach intellectual understanding. However, when you forget yourself in mustering body and mind in the act of practice, there is only that particular act in that particular breath moment. Then as Kim says, the whole universe is created in and through that act. Daido Roshi at Mount Tremper used to say, be what you do. Put yourself fully into what you're doing. Be what you do. This is to have self-centeredness fall away. Be what you do. When you're grating carrots, be grating carrots. You can smell it. You can feel it. You can feel the middle of the grate. You can hear the sound of that grating. You can see the curls or shreds of carrot falling in a pile. It's a wonderful experience. Be what you do. But if you're like thinking about, oh, geez, when this is done, I've got so much to do. I've got to pay the bills. I've got to like, oh, God, I... those carrots are dead, as are you. <clears throat> then, as Kim says, the whole universe is created through that act. With this experience, the things of the, with this, you experience the things of the universe. They are your confirmation, your enlightenment. In other words, it's not a vague and abstract experience. It's very concrete, very specific. Oh, this carrot. To be enlightened by all things of the universe is to cast off the body and mind of the self as well as that of others. Focusing body and mind with all one's inquiring spirit on a single matter like who is hearing? one of the introductory koans, but also was Basui's central practice. If you read the Three Pillars of Zen, a profound practice. Aiken Roshi said, if you want to um, realize what Buddhism is all about, if you want to realize Dogen's uh, way, um, who's hearing can take time, but it is the real deal. It really puts us in touch. 
focusing body and mind with all one's inquiring spirit on a single matter, or what is Mu? What is Mu? A monk asked Zhao Chu, in all seriousness, does even a dog have Buddha nature? And Zhao Chu, the great teacher, uh, answered, Mu. Literally, it means has not, or not, or no. But if that was all uh, that Mu uh, meant, literally, it wouldn't have come down with this tremendous power to open us to realization as it has for thousands and thousands of people in the last 1,000 years. Uh, that no is not nothing, but it is an important no. What does that mean, does not have? Don't the sutras say that all beings have Buddha nature? Dogen reinterpreted that to say all beings are Buddha nature. What is this matter of have or have not? Anyway, uh, that's the stray off the point. The myriad things communicate their wisdom with their forms and sounds and the emptiness, harmony and uniqueness of the ephemeral self in the world are understood clearly. As this is common to get on to be enlightened by all things is to cast off body and mind of the self as well as that of others. This is reminiscent of Paul's in Christianity, putting off the old man, not merely forgetting, but dying to the self. Um, this is often scary to people. Dying to the self? Ah! Uh, Rolling Stones have a great line in Ruby Tuesday, if you remember that song, dying all the time. Lose your dreams and you will lose your mind. In life unkind? Maybe that's not unkind. To lose one's mind, uh, not in a negative way, but to drop all of that that we carry. Uh, this is dying with every breath. The same thing as awakening with every breath. Uh, Manjushri, a patron of the Zendo with his delusion cutting sword, has a sword that kills and gives life at the same time. To die to the self is the great journey. Uh, however, uh, uh, one has to be uh, preparing for it, and that's what our practice is about. It can sound very um, threatening. Uh, but again, remember, your most wonderful moments were when you weren't stuck in yourself. Uh, so let that be your guide. Like being with a friend, like seeing the sunset, like listening to great music, uh, like petting your cat. Uh, dying, the great death is what Hawkorn called it. Uh, it's really the beginning of great birth, great life. Casting off body and mind should not be confused with self-denial. Many people suppose that they must get rid of the self. The Buddha too went through a phase of asceticism, avoiding food and sleep in an effort to overcome his desires. Such a path has a dead end, as the Buddha and others have found. We need food and sleep in order to cast off body and mind. The way is Gnostic, that is, about insight. It's not ascetic, about depriving the self, which becomes its own kind of ego-laden practice. Oh, I don't need this anymore. Oh, I'm really getting good. I don't need that anymore. Uh, no. It's about insight, understanding. Finally, as Dogen says, when you cast off body and mind, all other beings have the same experience. One version of the Buddha's exclamation under the Bodhi tree reads, I and all beings have at this moment entered the way. This does not mean all beings can now come along. Rather, at the Buddha's experience, all beings simultaneously cast off body and mind because from the very beginning, as Hakuin says in our introductory chant, in praise of Zazen before every Taisho, from the very beginning all beings are Buddha. Only our delusive uh, self-centered thinking prevents our realization of this, is what the Buddha himself spontaneously exclaimed upon his great enlightenment. So, when, and now here's a, a little uh, uh, story out of Zen. Uh, when Shui Feng, that would be Seppo in Japanese, and Yen To, that would be Ganto, uh, two favored characters in Zen literature, uh, Shui Feng was known as the man of effort, and Ganto, or Yen To, was known as the man of genius. 
brilliance came easily to him. Uh, Shui Feng or Seppo had to work on it. Ironically, uh, Ganto or Yento was uh, killed by bandits at a young age. Seppo went on to become a great teacher. Shui Feng went on to become a great teacher. Uh, it became a real uh, koan for Hakuan as a young man. How come this greatly enlightened person got murdered? Shouldn't enlightenment protect you from such things? Uh, but Yento had predicted that upon his death, he would give a great shout. This was years before it happened. And indeed, uh, upon his uh, being stabbed by bandits, he gave a great shout that was heard for miles. Uh, Hakuin really worked on this story as a koan. And, uh, and one of his enlightenment experiences, he said, uh, exclaimed, Ganto is alive and well. Toss that out to you. I'll see what you make of it. Now to go on. So when Shui Feng and Yento, that is Seppo and Ganto, were on pilgrimage together, they became snowbound in the village of Wushan Tian. This gave them time for an extended dialogue during which Shui Feng recounted his various spiritual experiences. Yento exclaimed, Haven't you heard the old saying, What enters from the gate, that is by intellection, cannot be the family treasure? Shui Feng suddenly had deep realization and exclaimed, at this moment, Wu Shan Tian has become enlightened. So he had many uh, experiences, spiritual experiences, had intellectual understanding. And uh, Yento took it all away. When it's all removed, what is there? What's always been there? Uh, a decisive moment for Shui Feng. With his exclamation, exclamation, Yen To cast off body and mind. Simultaneously, Shui Feng did the same. Personalizing Bell's theorem a thousand years and more before Bell, the whole village was uh, likewise um, uh, affected. Then, even the traces of enlightenment, to go back to Dogen, are wiped out and life with traceless enlightenment we might say a life of traceless environment. There's because there's no self clinging there to I'm enlightened. And that's what traceless enlightenment simply means. Uh, is continued ever and ever. That is, our practice continues more and more selflessly. Not forced, not I've got to get up and practice. It becomes as natural as breathing. What a relief. Go on. Wiping away the intimations of pride that come with the realization experience of the ultimate steps of Zen practice. Steps that never end. Hence the name of our Zendo, Endless Path. They form the way of the Bodhisattva. Polishing the mind of compassion. Engaging in the travail of the world. Entering the marketplace with bliss bestowing hands. Uh, you, of course, know the oxerting pictures, that is the tenth and final oxerting picture, entering the market as an ordinary person with helping hands. Uh, the verse for it goes something like, uh, without recourse to mystic powers, withered trees he swiftly brings to bloom or to life. We are all withered trees in the presence of someone of really, of real selflessness, we all come alive. We get in touch with our own selflessness. This is the gift that Zen practitioners can bring to the world. This gift of bringing withered trees to life. Our whole planet is becoming a withered tree. Zen is not a quick fix, but by experiencing our own reality, the selflessness in the best sense of the word, we become intimate with this planet, with its beings, with its people, with its complexities, with its confusions, with its anxieties, with its hatreds. And bring, uh, Roshi Kapil used to say, if you light a match in a completely dark room, the quality of that darkness is changed forever. Each one of us can be like a match. And this is what practice offers. Again, it's not a quick fix. And it's not for ourselves alone. But something shifts over time. And the practice continues 
endlessly. So over and over in koan practice, the Zen student works through the lesson of casting off, casting off. A monk said to Chao Chu, I've just entered this monastery, please teach me. Chao Chu said, have you eaten your rice gruel? The monk said, yes, I have. Chao Chu said, wash your bowl. Have you eaten your essential food? Yes, I have. If so, wipe that idea of attainment away. For our present limited purposes, this would be an explication of Chao Chu's meaning. What is left after body and mind are cast off, endlessly casting off ongoing practice. The Genjo Koan, which is what we've been looking at, ends with this story. When the Zen teacher Bao Che of Ma Ku was fanning himself, a monk asked him, the nature of wind is constant and there is no place it does not reach. Why then do you fan yourself? You get that? So the Zen teacher Pachu was fanning himself and a monk asked him, the nature of wind is constant and there is no place it does not reach. Why then do you fan yourself? Do you see what he's getting at? Mind is always present. Why are you making any effort to realize it? The nature of wind is constant. Why are you fanning yourself? Bao Chu said, you only know that the nature of wind is constant. You don't yet know the meaning of its reaching every place, every self, every one of us, every leaf, every being. You don't know yet the meaning of its reaching every place. The monk said, what is the meaning of its reaching every place? Bao Chu only fanned himself. The monk bowed deeply. Practicing this breath, this koan, this question, is how we fan ourselves. We can only practice because realization has been our nature from the very beginning. It is not added to us. You cannot get it any more than you can enter a room you never left. We just don't know it, but we can practice it. And it's only because we already have this full potential that we can practice the path of realization. The nature of the wind, says Aiken, Aiken Roshi, is Buddha nature, pervading the whole universe. The monk's question is an old one. If all beings by nature are Buddha, why should one strive for enlightenment? Dogen himself asked such a question in his youth and his doubts fueled his search for a true teacher. Pao Che takes the monk's words, reaching every place, as a figure of speech for Zen Buddhist practice that brings forth what is already there. As Dogen says in his comment to this story, the final words of the Genjo Koan, confirmation of the Buddha Dharma, the correct transmission of the vital way, is like this. If you say that one should not use a fan because the wind is constant, that there will be a wind even when one does not use a fan, you fail. Then you fail to understand either constancy or the nature of the wind. Let me repeat that. If you say that one should not use a fan because the wind is constant, it's like saying, well, we're all Buddhists. Why do I have to practice? That there will be a wind even when one does not use a fan, even when you don't practice, you'll be Buddha. Then you fail to understand either constancy or the nature of the wind. Dogen continues, it is because the nature of the wind is constant that the wind of the Buddha house brings forth the gold of the earth and ripens the kefir or yogurt the long river it turns everything into something alive and nutritious and gold but it doesn't happen unless you do the work and you can only do the work because it's already who you are 
That is the great paradox. Why? If it's already who you are, why? If you're already Buddha from the very beginning, have all the women and men of the past who've attained deep realization had to work so hard to get to it? If it's already who each one of us is, why must we work so hard at practice? Giving up our comfort zones, no longer listening simply to, well, this is reasonable. Uh, I think it was Oscar Wilde in De Profundis who said something like, an unreasonable moment may, the, may be the greatest moment of a person's life. Sometimes it's unreasonable to commit to practice. Oh, I have so many things to do. It's true, we all do. And yet, and yet, there is something that comes from it. We cannot find any other way because it's already ourselves. We just don't know it. The wind of the Buddha house, the practice of Zazen, realization and going beyond realization is altogether in accord with the wind of the universe, the Buddha mind. As Dogen says elsewhere, and this is something that we see in the, it's the Kyoju Kaimon, which we see in our Jukai ceremony every New Year's and also when people take individual, personalized, the, uh, the precepts, the 16 Bodhisattva precepts uh, in Jukai ceremony uh, individually. Um, there's this wonderful uh, commentary by Dogen on the precepts and uh, such that we do in the formal uh, complete Jukai ceremony. Uh, and he says, the Dharma wheel turns from the beginning. There is neither surplus nor lack. The whole universe is moistened with nectar and the truth is ready to harvest. The harvesting of truth, the practice of forgetting the self, the practice, it's always a practice. It's not a given, it's not a thought. It's a practice of realizing forms and sounds intimately the practice of polishing our mind of compassion. This is our joyous task. So that is the chapter on the way of Dogen uh, from Aiken Roshi's original dwelling place. I'll show you a photo if you haven't seen Aiken Roshi. Uh, there he is, the old guy himself. Of course, in the Doksan room, we have Kaplo Roshi. Aiken Roshi and Dane and Henry Roshi, who was my transmission teacher, all uh, people who worked very, very hard uh, and intimately because it meant a great deal to them. And only because of their efforts and of people like them that we are able to practice uh, intimately and seriously and sincerely uh, today, not just being uh, thought Buddhists, but being practice Buddhists. And to me, that is a terrific tremendous difference. So thank you all very much. I will uh, stop the recording. We will recite together our great vows for all. Uh, we will then have Kinghin, and then after that we will have another period of Zazen, and then that will be followed by our chanting service to end uh, this half day Zazen Kai. So let me uh, stop the recording and we'll go on from here.